Hello everybody, this is Critique Quest, and today I'm going to be talking about King Art Games' third-person gothic horror mystery adventure game for the PlayStation 4, PC, Mac, Linux, and Xbox One, titled Black Mirror. This has no affiliation with Charlie Brooker's television series, but is actually a reinvention of the original point-and-click adventure game from 2004 of the same name, which spawned two more sequels, none of which I have played, so this is a blind review. So, what works in Black Mirror? The game is full of small, creatively unique details that really stand out, not just against the game's other elements, but in some cases, other games generally. The first of which being the camera, which, to my mind, acts as another character. It's subtle but effective nonetheless. The camera in a video game helps to narrate a space. The fixed angles or predefined viewing frames, as seen in the 1996 horror game Resident Evil, create tension, for example, by obscuring what the player can or can't see. Whereas the camera in, say, The Last Guardian, is a following camera, which complements the platform elements, but when funneled down small spaces, spaces of which the player must share with Trico, it can result in a swamping of the camera view. Compare this to when the in-game space and camera opens up, however, and you have an exaggeration of scale through the use of contrast. In Black Mirror, the camera resembles the predefined viewing frames mentioned before. It behaves in a certain static way, depending on what the player is doing or where they are standing, by no means unusual for a point-and-click style game. Having said that, the camera doesn't so much snap to a position, but moves smoothly within its limits, which I much preferred. It hides away other characters just off camera when you thought you were alone in a room. It obscures the house's many mysteries, which plays beautifully into the secrecy of the game's narrative. But what I really like about how it's utilized here is how it narrates the space in an autonomous, suggestive sort of way. Walking into the foyer, it will loom high above the playable protagonist Tom's head to focus on the darkened landing above a vast, obscured space bearing down on him and you. It will sidestep to reveal a room black as pitch while hiding the fireplace behind its back almost sneakily. Walk about the maze of a cellar and it moves about the stack of shelves as if it's equally unsure of which direction you are heading in. Somewhat unusually, The camera doesn't quite feel like an extension of you, or even Tom, but something outside of you. Like one of the game's many spirits, it has a mind of its own, and one that is unfriendly, secretive, and perhaps just as confused as you are. This ties in and leads me to the narrative themes. At the heart of Black Mirror's gothic horror is the concept of long familial histories and the skeletons they hide in decades-old closets. Without giving too much away, the game's story is a heady mix of the supernatural, gothic, mysterious and dramatic, and all of this to the backdrop of Bonnie, Scotland. Quite an unusual location, and a breath of fresh air from the standard gothic fare, being 19th century London or some other yoldy town in the English countryside. How all this is presented appears to be a bone of contention, for good reason, I think. But one thing that helps the game's story rather than hinder it are the, shall we say, wonky visuals. Character models specifically look a little off-kilter. It all made me think of the animated movie Monster House, a personal favourite of mine, where every character feature is a little exaggerated and recreated from clay sculptures based on the remarkable work of artist Chris Applehans. Though not nearly as extreme, The models in Black Mirror have a similarly extravagant, clay-like appearance leaning more towards caricature than photorealism, and this adds a strange Cluedo charm to a cast of characters shrouded in mystery, and offsets the manor house quite uniquely too. The house itself looks quite realistic in my view, and so the characters rather take on the appearance of dollies, quietly moving about their dollhouse. Obviously this might annoy some, but I thought it added some visual texture, akin to Burton, to the gothic horror genre in which the game resides. Before I move on to the next, there was one thing that 
I suppose ties into this wonkiness, though definitely exists within the realm of visuals, concerning Tom that must be touched upon. Generally speaking, Tom is a pretty solid character. It helps, of course, that his thoughts run alongside conversations, which gives him a bit more personality and a frame of reference. How does he see this person? How does he view what is happening? It's the kind of running commentary Nathan Drake popularised and spawned a thousand copies of, most of which never really add personality to a character, but simply, well, running commentary. Since we're cognizant of Tom's thoughts on the inside, though, rather than the outside, it works quite well in further fleshing this character out. Good thoughts and bad. What's really special about Tom, however, is his character animation, or more specifically, his tick. Why am I mentioning this? Well, we all have little ticks that make us who we are. Part of what made Jake Gyllenhaal's performance in Prisoners, for example, so exceptional was his excessive, forced blink that gave him this focused, slightly neurotic look of intelligence. It's the sort of thing that often separates us from animated characters. Talk about the Uncanny Valley. One of the main reasons this exists at all is because most characters and character animations in more realistic visual styles are stripped of what makes people truly real or appear real. Faults, physical mannerisms and behaviours, gait, habits, I could go on. I can only imagine this must be incredibly difficult to implement, otherwise we'd see it all the time. But Black Mirror's Tom Gordon has a kind of tick. He displays a physical mannerism, or habit, by rubbing and scratching his left upper arm throughout the game. This wouldn't be all that special if he did this during cutscenes alone, yet he also displays this during his idle animation and even in the act of play, lifting it from the realm of indirect narrative and placing it firmly within his physical character, his physical being. It isn't overused either. In fact, it happens fairly irregularly, which makes it all the more intriguing. That Tom seems to touch his arm in slightly uncomfortable scenes suggests to me that when he does it in play, that too means he's uncomfortable. Maybe the wind is a little too cold, the garden a little too dark. It's a really minor detail that I feel bears mentioning. So what doesn't work? Quite a number of things, I'm sad to report. The first, and in my opinion the most egregious, are the loading screens. They're far too frequent. Each time you walk through a door and into a new area, there will be a plain black loading screen that can last anywhere from a few seconds to considerably more. This alone isn't too much of an issue, and it isn't so apparent in sections of the game where you're otherwise occupied solving puzzles, talking with NPCs, but oftentimes areas of the house you travel to are but a stone's throw away from your current position or from each other. As a result, you spend a significant chunk of play waiting around. The loading screens do fracture cutscenes as well, acting as a sort of pause button on the action, which a story relying on building mystery could well do without. The game too has very little in the way of ambience. Wandering about the house is, atmospherically speaking, rather hollow. Despite the structural architecture of the house and grounds, and aesthetic, which is opulent and rich in colour, even though it's dark and very expansive in a quirky kind of way, the act of navigating it offers no real atmosphere, tension or otherwise, perhaps because of the aforementioned loading screens, this could also be because there's very little going on concerning ambient sound in the game, save for rain, a crackling fire, a clock chime, a few scarce discordant tones. Silence creates the equivalent of an atmospheric vacuum. Though you could argue that silence can be a kind of mood in and of itself. However, ambience is vital to any gothic story, and it feels to me as in the Silent Hill High Definition remaster, as if a screen wiper has scrubbed away any shroud of the gothic or stimulating visual or audio, leaving behind a bit too clean an atmospheric slate. Where gameplay is concerned, dialogue choices 
appear to offer no real choice, which makes participation in conversation feel somewhat redundant. You can choose the order in which you ask your questions, but the game often requires you to ask them all, and any new information you glean for future options or dialogue choices are always part of the main plot, offering no real added texture or option to find out more than the base narrative expects that I could see. It all makes you feel a bit like a passenger in a car, wondering why you have to tap on the metaphorical dashboard when you really just want to grab a hold of the wheel. The performances are a little hit and miss. Also, though I think that is in large part down to the odd pauses in between dialogue and reactions, due to player prompts and loading screen interruptions, something from which the sound also suffered in general, even the credits cut mid-song at the end rather than fade out. As you can imagine, this wreaks havoc on the game's tone. Black Mirror was also buggy. Now, I want to say here that bugs aren't always an issue for me. I understand that the more complex video game systems become, the more likely bugs to become, because of the sheer amount of potential variables you just can't plan for. Still, the game is quite contained, shall we say, and during my 6-8 to eight hour experience, the game encountered at least four errors that shut down the whole show. There was also a colourful cornucopia of things, such as stuttering frames, camera in the head, odd cutscene transitions, and others. Prompts had a tendency to also be a tad unresponsive. Chances to examine could be fiddly. The window of interaction feels so small, you have to be standing in just the right spot to be able to examine something, which can leave you positioning and repositioning yourself to get it just right. To summarize, play is full of proverbial sharp corners to bump into and injure yourself on, which is quite a surprise considering how restricted the overall experience actually feels. Whether that be within the physical space and its camera, gameplay mechanics or the game's story. King Art Games' Black Mirror feels ambitious to me, perhaps a bit too ambitious, that it offers a rare slice of personality-driven animation in Tom, and an autonomous narrator in the game's camera shouldn't be overlooked and deserves praise, in my opinion. Yet it ceases to be as enjoyable as it could due to the above cons, which is such a shame. My research failed to show any planned patches, for the PS4 version at any rate. Another shame, as I think a few tweaks here and there could potentially turn the overall experience around into a positive rather than a negative. However, there may be a completely reasonable explanation for this. Thank you for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Feel free to share your thoughts and comments about Black Mirror 2017 here, on my Facebook page or on Twitter, the links to which are down below. I try to read and respond to as many comments as I can. I will see you soon.